All right, welcome everybody to day 29. This is the start of the fifth week I know, oh of gosh. our physical distancing broadcast that we're doing every day at 6 p.m. until uh, we get 1,000 YouTube subscribers. Um, so please go over there and subscribe just so that we can get 1,000. Then that will allow us to broadcast live from our phones Which from the field. Way better. Yeah, and our, our big awesome. goal is to have that happen by April 22nd. You're wondering what's so auspicious about April 22nd. Oh, oh, well, yeah. it is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Just My 50th Earth Day. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, I've only been alive when Earth Days have been happening. So. Anyway, so um, try to get. We're gonna. Try, we only need 322 more subscribers. We've gained 200 in the last week. Yay, we need thank another you. 322 subscriber. YouTube.com/slash/WolfCampCollege. And um, Kim is gonna show a couple of books that we're gonna be um, using today on our wild edible plant walk. We're gonna be trying to show you that you can actually install these wild edibles in your yard. Um, this whole thing here, I built. Now, this is overboard. All you need is like, uh, well, you could use a little tub of some sort to create a little pond to have mm -hmm. the most, number one, most important wild edible food plant, which is right behind me. We're going to talk about that. Um, and so that's the plan today. So the books that you want to take a look at are, do you want to do them or should I? You can do it. I'll hold it up. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Bonnie it's in a backwards. day. It's backwards, uh, but you get it. Tom Elpel, and get a hold of that. That really teaches you all the wild, the plant families. Has the best wild edible, and medicinal, and um, utilitarian uses of the plants, both scientific and his own personal use. He's in the same field as we are. I think it's, to, it's sold 120,000 copies so far. Yep. It's amazing. It's in color. Yep. Which is nice. So that's anywhere in the country, North America, yep. and then for our local area, of course. While uh, plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast, or get whatever your best local field guide for um, identifying wild plants in your area. In the city, it's really hard to identify trees and plants because they could be planted from anywhere around the world. Do not start there if you're starting from scratch. <laughs> and then uh, when we get to our wild edible um, yard greens and things like that, there are only 17 in this book, 17 chapters by John Collis, wild, Edible Wild Plants. And that's just for one of our categories of top 10 which is choose your best wild edible green out of your yard and garden yes and um, i had one comment somebody asked about dandelion i haven't read the whole thing yet about whatever you posted but um, john collis has a huge chapter on just dandelion in here and some other aster family plants which are one of the most common weeds in north america probably the biggest plant family Yay. in north northern part of North America and a lot of edibles including dandelions we're going to be actually harvesting um, some today. But I was we, thinking we might do a dandelion day actually. Well yeah we did fry up dandelions That's in one of the true. earlier but broadcasts about two them, weeks we'll ago. Yeah all right so let's start with number one. All right so number one is right here. Uh, you can just dig a hole in your uh, yard and install some of these really easy to do. Uh, installing them is the same. I better take off my ring and put them right here. Don't forget it. Yeah. You should give it to me. Okay. Well, it's right there. It's okay. Good. Uh, and it's best to uh, try to harvest with your hands on this because what you're trying to get on this is a, a cattail. And you can see all the leaves from last year all falling down, snow breaks them down, things like that. This little green one coming up right here is actually totally round. And it's a bit of an anomaly. This is one of the most important plants for craft called um, bulrush or tule, which DNA is shown is actually a sedge. But, but, so it's kind of an exception to the rule. But anyway, this is cattail over here. And cattail is the closest related plant family to it is a sedge as well. And we're going to talk about the difference between sedge, rushes, and grasses in a minute when we get done with this. But first, I'm going to pull out a cattail as best I can. Now, there are some wild uh, invasive grasses in here, which are great. They're also edible. They're also uh, very useful, utilitarian for making thatching and stuff like that. This is a, uh, I'm gonna come over here and show you so you don't confuse this with a cattail, but this is a reed canary grass, our most invasive species in this area. And it's edible and stuff, which is nice, but it really 
takes over the um, local native wild plants and so you have to be very careful about trying to keep these down. The only thing that works is to mow it, weed eat it all the time, uh, or shade it out. Of course, you don't want to shade out cattails and other um, these wetland plants. They like sun and so it's a really hard thing to get rid of. So we are always pulling out, including all the roots. It grows by rhizome just like cattails do. And so you got to pull out all the roots. And notice that grasses have a stalk with leaves on them. So the difference between rushes, sedges, and grasses are sedges have edges, usually very sharp edges. There's some right here, and I'll pull one up so you can see. There's a bunch of sedges growing here as well, and these are really sharp. Sedges have edges. As a matter of fact, if you go this way, they have like microscopic scales that hold on. Sedges have edges, rushes are round, and that's why this is called bulrush, this other little one right here. I'm not going to pull it out because we only have a few very important plants in for thatching and other things. Uh, so sedges have ed edges, rushes around, grasses have leaves on stock to the, on a stalk to the ground. So that's the rhyme. You can say it now to remember. Yeah, and grasses, you might notice they kind of have an alternating uh, leaf and there's just two of them that alternate but when you look at your sedges they actually come kind of in threes and if you notice the leaves on the sedges um, are really bent and triangular and now grass is one of our top ten most important as a matter of fact it might be the most important in the world I mean think about the uh, oh yeah, yeah actually grasses are so yeah. they said that there's like I think 50 percent of people's food calories that they get are from grass family yeah. plants. And we're talking oats, we're talking wheat, we're talking rice, rice we're talking rice, this is 20% yep. in the world probably. And wheat's 20%. Wheat, we've got uh, sugar, and as a matter of fact, sugar is just what really grows this plant. And so sugar cane is a giant grass, and so you just, uh, a new leaf, wherever it's put, the sh grass is putting its energy is where it's putting its sugar. Once it starts dying and turning um, brown like these uh, other things back here in the winter, all the sugars drop down in the bottom of the stalk so you can harvest the bottom stalk, chew on it, and pull out just like sugar cane. But right now it's putting its energy into the leaves. And so, mm, so you walk along and find the best tasting, sugar tasting grass as you can. Chew it up, three or four chews until it starts to taste grassy, and then spit it out, swallow that juice full of different kinds of glucose sugars. All right, so that's one. We're done with grasses. <laughs> but of course, um, we do have one grass. Can you grab one? A different kind of grass is an orchard grass, I believe, that is already going to flower and seed oh, behind you. Right there. Oh. Almost touching it. Yep. And... Um, I'm going to bring one over here, and of course, the complex carbohydrates, not the simple carbohydrates that are, you know, sugar cane stuff used to grow it. Uh, look at that. It's already going to seed, this orchard grass, and you can chew on that. That's complex carbohydrates. However, it's full of chaff. So, another one where you don't want to do this and then have to talk and make a presentation because that chaff gets caught in your throat. However, this is really, really soft little chaff. Now, a wheat or something that has big grains, it'll just poke right into your mouth. You do not want to eat that chaff. This one's not bad. That's actually a very good moment right now. Not too hard. Here, I'm gonna try. Yeah, go for I'll it. So one. good. Okay. All right, so that's some complex carbohydrates. All right, let's go and get some attack meal. So cattails, you can eat them all year round, so that's really wonderful. Um, sometimes they're a little harder to get, depending on how uh, muddy everything is. But um, the other thing to consider is right now, the plant is going to be starting to put its energy into the leaves and not into the rhizome, which is the part that we would want to eat. This is the new leaf coming up right here, and it is a narrow leaf, as opposed to these rushes right here that are round. And so... I'm going to get down there and find, I'm not going to pull this new one, well I could pull this new one out because it's a really, these new shoots are delectable, they're like a gourmet shoot, but it's the rhizome going underneath that has full of complex carbohydrates, is that almost the same compound as a potato inside the rhizome underneath the ground, and so because this is pretty close to the tulies and I do want the tulies to come in closer, I'm going to harvest this whole one right here, 
Uh, oh, there's a couple new other new ones right here. So I'll, I'll harvest the closest one okay. and try to follow it back. Be able to get as much rhizome out of here as possible. Are there any questions on the comments right now? Um, not specifically about cattails right now. Okay. Nope, looks like there's nope, the dandelion question. So I gotta dig out. Oh, and by the way, we um, planted this pond in where there's a lot of clay. So it's hard to get these cattails out of this clay. But, uh,. Unfortunately, I broke this one out. This is going to be really delectable. And so let's definitely cook that up. Okay. Doesn't even need cleaning. That right there, if it was a gourmet restaurant, would be uh, several dollars. <laughs> that one right there. Oh, yeah. All right. So I'm going to try to get a rhizome out so people can see that, though. Oh, yeah. Got it. Look at that. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah pretty good for getting it out of clay now most oh, cat natural shoot. cattail plant ponds are uh, oh another shoot there yeah you want to rinse it give it a little yeah, shake yeah. so first thing you want to do is clean it just like if you're harvesting potatoes get the dirt off get the dirt off best you can and then we're going to stop by if we have time and clean it off more in the hose all these are the true roots right here sorry just flash cam <laughs> <laughs> oh can you plug in my um phone into the battery because it's about to die uh, thank you. This is a shoot, and probably a bunch all the way up to about that point are going to be good and delectable. All you need to do is like fry it for a minute, uh, heat it over some coals of the fire, and just eat it straight. Right now, you have to cook it though, because any water in North America pretty much has giardia or cryptosporidium or other things. So you have to cook things that you get out of the water. Um, if you pre present this to Dinner guests, of course, you want to cut off all of the roots and clean this up really well. And then it's a little bit stringy, so it doesn't have the texture of potato, but you cook it exactly, you know, you season it. Butter, Sour cream. whatever you normally like to eat <laughs> potatoes with, straight up is all good. You can just put that, now if you're just survival, you put that right on the coals of the fire, heat it up to kill whatever was in it, start breaking it open and just eat it. Yeah, that's cattails right there now if you're trans just if you can go out to a cattail pond try to harvest one that's not very uh, near a railroad or a road or anything like that they actually put cattails in bioswales to clean things up because it's a bioaccumulator sucks in toxins and it'll often look black and stuff and you'll see those toxins in there yeah but you want to harvest from a very clean source and if you want to a transplant you can bring them from maybe wherever and they will grow by rhizome out and you can um, you can just put them in a you know a, not a pot that drains but a top pot that actually holds uh, water because it needs these feet need to stay wet at all times and so you can grow the top one most important wild edible food plant in North America north of where there's like palm and a bunch of southern nut trees and things like that is cattail. That's where you have to go find a cattail in a survival situation anywhere north of the middle part, middle states, I would say, in order to stay get any carbohydrates. All right. Oh, you're going to let me have a nice. That's so nice. Kimber's got me a uh, towel to clean up. All right, cool. Uh, there's other. Oh, let's see. Eating. Oh. My cousin Sue says eating cattails well. By the way, Sue, you got to respond to the uh, question about whether we're going to have our virtual family reunion this weekend. <laughs> All right. And then Mike Beckett asked, what does it taste like? Potatoes. Totally. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's got a lot of little fibers that run through it this direction. So when I cook it, Texture I like to chop it this way. Yeah. So then you don't have all the fibers to worry about. You just eat them and it's no big deal. All right. Sh um, shall we go to the next, uh, one of the next top ones? Yeah. Here, right. do you want to grab? Oh, yeah, sure. This is going to be okay. floating. I'm going to leave this here. Okay. And. All right. Okay. All right. So anyway, we're going to head um, over this direction. And the next thing I'm going to stop at is going to be stinging nettle. Now, we did a whole broadcast about three weeks ago on stinging nettle, so go check that out. But just for fun, I'm going to um, grab one and eat a leaf and okay. see if I can still present 
Um, now they do, of course, have. Um, it says that my battery still is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me give you that. All right. So, hi everybody. I get that. So that. This is. Uh, I'm gonna pull one leaf now. The stingers on the are all over the plant, including the stem, both sides of the leaf, and everything. But they, the hairs come toward you. So if you kind of pull toward yourself, you can just pull one off and not worry about getting stung. And now you can just like break. Now it's going to have different nutrition based on whether you cook. Most people will just cook it, or you can of course, que you know, grind it all up in a cuisinart or something and make pesto just like you would basil. And all those hairs get broken up, and so they, all that stuff that stings you underneath your hand, uh, is really great nutrition. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and eat this. I'm going to ball it up real small, break all those hairs up. And don't do this at home, unless, or go back and watch Kim do it, because she explains exactly how to do this so that you don't. Uh, you didn't wash your hands. After oh, being Kim won't let water. me eat this because I didn't wash my hands after um, uh, <laughs> sticking my hands in the water. That oh, might have goodness. something. All right. I can do it really. Fast. Okay. All right. Ding, 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 well, ding, ding, no big deal. Oh no, I just jumped the end up. Oh. oh, I'm no, I'm not gonna eat it. I'm okay. just saying that she you did demonstrate already. A couple, I know, three I did. Ago. But there, this is the fast version. I'm down the hatch. Yeah. And can you believe that people actually have a stinging nettle contest? A stinging nettle eating contest? I think it's over in Europe. There's two guys that said that they had too many they each one said that they had more stinging nettles than the other one on their farm and so they created this competition and I have no idea how they came up with it. But they take a two foot section of stinging nettles, like a whole bunch of them. And they say go, and they strip off the leaves and eat them, and whoever eats the most wins. <laughs> okay, well let's go to um, another plant that's in the top ten in our area at least. And oh my gosh, we should do one on the aster. Oh, oh there's some nice this little dandelion and everything. Oh, we're gonna do that later. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so we're going to stop here at um, one of the pine family trees that are in our yard. And this is the Pacific Northwest's pride and joy, uh, the Sitka spruce. Hey! <laughs> Sitka spruce, you can tell it's a spruce because when you bump up against it, it hurts. Yeah, but isn't it beautiful? <laughs> so you can see that the new buds are coming out and the spruce, yes, it's very, very rough if you grab it, pointy tips. Um, but the new buds are absolutely delectable. <gasps> Look at that. Can I have it? Yeah, so when you put needles from these trees in your water. You want the whole thing? Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, you just want to be careful, really careful not to swallow them. It's the only really, time really you can stiff. eat them because they're so stiff. But if you get the, the new you buds, you can eat them or swallow mm -hmm. them or whatever. Full of vitamin they C. Won't hurt you. That's your vitamin C source. The pine tree, pine family, pine, spruces, firs, western hemlock tree or eastern hemlock tree, which is not to be confused with the poison hemlock plant in the carrot family. Um, yeah, what should we stop at next? Um, now as far, yeah, of course there's pine nuts. Um, can we go over to the um, blueberries real quick? Sure. Okay, we're gonna go to the blueberries next, although they're not quite flowering yet. Oh, they are, the early blueberries. Oh, they are, the early blueberries, great. Um, berries, uh, we're gonna stop at the number one most important genus to know, but this is like about number two. This is the vaccinium genus. Anything that looks like a blueberry, which you have to positively identify because there are so many other poisonous little berries that look similar. But look at those flowers. Yum, yum. Blueberries often in the wild have red mm -hmm. stems. Uh, <laughs> red huckle huckleberries often have green stem red huckleberries anyway. And so huckleberries and blueberries, basically huckle blueberries are a blue huckleberry. This should be good, unless it's uh, well, it might have died out. Oh, yep. Okay, well, let's just keep good thing we're broadcasting on. Okay, uh, here, so you take this. Here's the key about this particular fruit. If you want to know that you've got something that's in the blueberry huckleberry family, what you're going to look for is a fruit that has a stem and then the actual fruit. So when you pick the fruit, you'll see a little dot on the back where the stem went in. If you flip it over and you look at the other side, you're going to see what looks like a little crown of skin that's in the same color as that fruit, and then a dot right in the middle. So um, what you're actually looking at, that dot in the middle is where the pistil on the flower was, and the flower was on the other side. And so you can actually see, if 
you pick one of these off, there's your, whoops, I think I just knocked off the pistol. The pistol was in the middle, and then your crown is this part right here, and then the whole thing will turn color. I know that we won't be able to have a berry if we eat this, but any berry that's edible, you can, oh great, you, you can, can pretty eat much eat all the flowers. Mm. Yeah, so anyway, you look for where the stem mm, goes in, so that good. dot on the back, the fruit, flip it over, you've got the crown of the skin that sticks up and the little dot in the middle um, where the pistol was, and that tells you that you have got mm. something in the blueberry and huckleberry family. Blueberry. doesn't have those things, um, don't eat it. Because no. there's Absolutely so many don't. little round rare areas that, there. Mm -hmm. that are not good for you. Should we go around that way? Um, or that way? Let's, let's go around this way. Okay, it's okay. for you that way. All right, can you take your phone? There you go. I'll take yours. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Involved, I can talk. Okay. All right. So. Hey, it's Tori. Ter Tori's on there? Yeah. Oh, Tori, you should comment and school us <laughs> on stuff. Tori started at camp when he was seven. Pretty sure. Now he's gone on to other greater, bigger, and better things as an old man. Okay, so next stop we're going to do is introducing, well first, and we're going to continue with the berries because this is the most important uh, berry genus to know because it's the safest and it grows most places. Um, this is an example of the Rubus genus, also known as blackberry raspberry, which is our native salmon berry. Ooh. And it's already um, pollinated. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, huck the hummingbirds have been really in here. And these petals are just falling right off, meaning that berry is already going to develop, even if I eat all of these, because it's already fertile. Mm. Quite good. Now, the um, Rubus genus uh, leaves are also purported to be really great for herbal reasons. They're uh, astringent, meaning they are drying. Dry. They put one in your mouth, especially the older they get. They'll just dry, <laughs> dry it out. And uh, people use it to kind of mitigate some di diarrhea effects. So, all right. So that's uh, berries. It's another one of our top ten most important ones. The top berry to know is the Rubus genus, the raspberry blackberry genus. And in Ready? this bioregion, they're they're all edible, and you can tell that you've got this particular genus because the fruits are aggregates. They look like little knobby berries or a whole bunch of little teeny balls all stuck together. I mean, y'all know what a blackberry looks like or a raspberry. It's any plant, any fruiting, or any fruit that you see like that out in our bioregion is edible, which is great. So you don't have to worry about it at all. And some people like to say that the way that you can identify that you have a salmon berry is you. Can you hold this up? Oh, yeah. Hold this, this. one? Oh, that. Okay, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay, so that you can take the leaves and bring the top back. It looks like a little butterfly, which it does. Really cute. Okay. All right, are we ready? Yeah. Um, yeah, so my the battery wasn't actually plugged into the correct uh, port, so I just started my new, uh, my live again. I'm going to have to, of course, cancel it, but we'll use the, we'll put the Wolf Camp one up on the website. All right, so inside uh, this, uh, down low, this is a guild that we planted here. We have low-lying plants. So we've got There's some comfrey. comfrey for me medicine down there. We've got the next layer, it's the salmon berries. The next layer up is hazelnuts. And take a look at this right here. The hazelnut leaves, are they visible? I can't tell, there we go. Um, are um, just coming out, but remember, um, I think maybe the third or fourth broadcast we did, the most important plant for going, well, the second most important plant for toilet paper out in nature. Hazelnut's great because it's so soft. And you can see the velvety leaves right now. Way too small for anything like that, but. Now the, the flower has already developed and is pollinated back in like January and February. It's a unique uh, reproductive system. And that beaked hazelnut is right in there now, if that one got fertilized tiny little flower it's really almost impossible to see the catkins are quite big so you can see those but uh this we're going to go into it tomorrow because we're going to be making hazelnut stuff stuff yep oh you're not going to tell nope okay so join us back tomorrow at six o'clock to make hazelnut. well let's tell them hazelnut milk right 
Yeah, and then a dessert out of it. And a dessert. Mm-hmm. And are we going to make any hazelnut flour? Not necessarily. I don't know. Uh, well, let's go. I mean. And then Wednesday, we're going to go to the next plant. Let's head on over there. Okay. And uh, introduce another of our top 10 most important ones, which is the oak. Oh, and boy. This right here, oaks maintain their leaves all winter long. I mean, they're brown, obviously. Uh, but in the new buds developed all the buds usually develop in late summer and fall on uh, most trees and shrubs but uh these are the little old r- shriveled up oak leaves look how tiny they are still anyway so that they make of course acorns is their nut and so on wednesday we're going to in the kitchen we'll just work, be spending wednesday with, together i love how you don't want acorns. to give away exactly what we're doing no, acorn no. flour you've already we talked about what that. we've done and uh, anyway we'll show you how to process them and, and we're going to make some really stuff. yummy stuff out of there like pancakes so, <laughs> yes. well people want to know, know because they want to get already, ready to you already mentioned it the other recipes. Day, so. all right um let's see is that about it well i mean it is 6 30 okay, now okay great so it's 6 30 um, we're gonna, that's introducing what's coming up next. Now go to our blog Here. at wolfcollege.com and you'll uh, be able to read more about the top 10 most important um, plants. And so that's at wolfcollege.com and just search on the blog uh, for top 10 most important and plants. And the nice thing about all of these things is when we started out, we didn't necessarily have all of these things in our yard. Like this oak tree is new and we've got another one that's just started. The birds will get them and they'll drop them in your yard. So these are things that you can just grow yourself. You don't have to go to an oak forest to get them. It's just like the cattails. We made that pond. So you can do that too. A spruce tree you can plant. Any of the um, pine family trees that are edible you can plant. All these fruit like the salmon berries we put those in and they have a bunch of hazelnuts we planted. So um, it's taken years but these are things that you can do um, very easily. Yeah. And, and those oaks and look for the native oh, ones metals, in your area too. and as far as oaks make it a white oak because it takes a lot less processing than red right. oaks. Can I have one more thing about yeah, stinging please. nettle? Mm-hmm. So um, with stinging nettles if you want to put them in your yard just be aware that they really really can spread and so um, if you put them in and you think oh well I can just mow it down that doesn't necessarily help to take it out you'd have to till it back in so um, when you bring in stinging nettles put them in an area where you are fine with them a being. A raised bed or a pot. Yeah or something could like do that. that could do that and we just have them in the back of the yard so um, you could grow them in your garden if you wanted they grow really well but mm-hmm. might not be wise when you're harvesting actually we had a stinging nettle in our garden every time I go to harvest lettuce it would get me a little sneaker <laughs> yeah, it sure does. I don't know what happened to it we must have rode it till the yeah, number but anyway okay well let's call it a day and tomorrow hazelnuts yes, we'll see hazelnuts, you in the outdoor kitchen gumminess. bye everybody bye. be well